Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. And in February of 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm 80 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia. I've been on a ketogenic diet since April of 2014. When I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've lost about 100 pounds. I've completely turned my health around. And this show is a document of my progress through ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for years in ketosis. Oh, yeah. And hopefully that <laughs> might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yep. We're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? Uh, No. <laughs> We've done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind that. We hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put links in the show notes to cite research supporting any claims that we make. And you'll probably figure out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. Yep. We love to cook and we love mm -hmm. to eat. In every sure episode, do. we both share a keto recipe that cannot be ignored. It cannot. So, let's start podcast number 93, The Big Fat Fix with Dr. Asim Malhotra. So, Richard, do we have any apologies or corrections from last week's show? Uh, last week's show was the Thanksgiving show with uh, Brenda Zorn and Kevin Mountain. Yeah. I have no intention of apologizing for Brenda Zorn. <laughs> no, that, was, that was such a great show. It was. We've been speaking to a lot of people for whom I have no intention of apologizing. <laughs> I guess lately. so. So, Well, yeah. you know, and the fact is that, you know, when we were starting the show, we did a lot more science than we do now. Now we're talking about stories and, you know, yeah. those things need fact checked. So Yes, they do. Sometimes we got our facts wrong. Mm-hmm. Sure did. So, let's revisit what a ketogenic diet is. Sure. Ketogenic diet is 20 grams of carbohydrates or less per day. Yep. Uh, protein scales with lean body mass. So, you want about mm -hmm. one to one and a half grams of protein for every kilogram of lean body mass per day. Yep. Mm -hmm. And all of our energy we get from fat. fat. <laughs> Either the fat on your plate or that Krispy Kreme you ate a decade ago that you've stored for later on. <laughs> Hey, speaking of Krispy Kremes, you know, I'm thinking about finding a donut recipe for Christmas. Really? Yeah, like uh, keto donuts, maybe some almond flour or something. Something okay. to splurge on that isn't going to be carby. Yep, fair enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll let you know how that goes. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> how was your week, my friend? Um, it was interesting. We had a massive hailstorm and all Ooh. of a sudden our roof started leaking. And it wasn't like it was leaking in one spot. It was like... Water was coming out of the moulding <laughs> between the ceiling Whoa. and the walls and down inside the walls. And, in fact, oh. we, we collected about two inches of rainwater inside our kitchen cupboards. So oh, my gosh. It was, like, everywhere. Uh, so uh, so that, was my, <laughs> that was my week. I've spent that. <laughs> How on the earth did you get rid of it? I mean, what did well, you do? mop it all up. That's all you can do, you know. And now we've got uh, – we're talking to uh, – the owner of the property to uh, get a tarp on the on the on the roof to a temporary uh, facility until they can work out what to do. There must be water damage too. Oh yeah, yeah. We, we had a light fixture that was hung from the ceiling. It was like one of the, it was like an upside down uh, hubcap of, of glass kind of thing, huh. and it was absolutely full of water. It was like an it was like a fish tank attached to wow. our ceiling with a light globe inside it. So yeah, oh it was pretty gosh. scary stuff. <laughs> so, wow. But, uh, other than that, I've had a normal week. Uh, probably haven't lost a lot of weight. Uh, I did a four-day fast. I'm back down to the lowest weight I've ever been, but I don't seem to be going much further beyond that. So I think for me it's an opportunity to keep calm and keto on. That's great. Mm. Yeah. And how was your week, Carl? My week was good. Um, I'm on day two or just finishing day two of a three-day fast. Yep. And uh, I'm I'm giving my pancreas a little break before I go to Italy to pick up my daughter Emmy. Nice. She's been over there for mm -hmm. three months working as an au pair. Get cool. this, it's a baby, and the parents both work at a vineyard. 
Oh, nice. And not only <laughs> do they make wine, but they make olive oil. And sure. I'm going right at the end of harvest season, so oh, I'm going to- Oh, perfect. Yeah, nice. I'm going over with an empty suitcase and returning yeah. with a full one. <laughs> so, are we saying that olive oil for the next season is going to taste of Carl Franklin's toes? <laughs> Uh, gee, I hope not. <laughs> I hope it doesn't taste of anyone's yeah. toes, quite frankly. So, so they're not putting you to work, are they? <laughs> you can keep your toes out of my olive oil. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, but uh, so anyway, yes, um, we're having a new London keto meetup on um, Wednesday night, which was probably by the time this show comes out last Wednesday. Yeah, and then of course the day after that is Thanksgiving. So. Yeah. Uh, I've spent the last couple of days uh, prepping, mm -hmm. and uh, if you remember the Thanksgiving show from last year, what I do is I debone the turkey. In other words, yep. take the backbone out, mm -hmm. take the femurs out of the legs, take the thighs off the breast, nice. and I take all the bones and roast them in a pan with olive oil in the oven, get them nice and brown, and then I make stock, and that mm -hmm. turns into gravy. Yeah. Yeah. And then I stuff the legs with herbs, sage, salt, uh, mm -hmm. rosemary, thyme. And uh, so those are all dressed and they're in the fridge and everything's ready to go. And tomorrow, which would be Wednesday, I make stuffing. Mm -hmm. uh, I made a pumpkin pie tonight. That's my recipe. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, a lot of yeah. food. No, I get it. No. So here in Australia, of course, we don't have Thanksgiving. And I've mentioned last week and also on Dr. Fung's new show, the Obesity Code podcast, that in Australia we have Boxing Day, which is a right. big event for cricket. But in fact, tomorrow in Australia, Thursday in Australia, which will be Thanksgiving in America, uh, tomorrow in Australia is the beginning of the ashes. And so this oh. is the beginning of the cricket season. So yeah. uh, I was just thinking about, you know, the, the we were talking about on the Obesity Code podcast the fact that we gain weight during the holiday season between Thanksgiving right. and New Year. Well, that's that kind of corresponds to the cricket season in Australia. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that relates to suicides or not, but... <laughs> Uh, it's because everybody's sitting around drinking beer and not yeah, moving. You know, it's like, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome. uh, we in America we have Unboxing Day, which is Christmas. Uh, okay. You know, we, yeah. Fair we enough. Just yep. Unwrap all our boxes. No, I don't know. I, why do they call it Boxing Day anyway? No one knows. I don't think. Huh. But it, it's it, it's just it's just like on Christmas Day you have your close family, you know, parents and children uh, get yeah. together and have presents, and then on Boxing Day all the extended family goes to one person's place and has a big nosh up, and you know, yeah. and everybody brings a dish, and it, it, that's kind of what Thanksgiving is like. Yeah, uh, sure. But, but we don't formalize it, so yeah, just, yeah that's it just good. It's all good. Yeah. Get together, eat, drink, be merry, have fun with your yeah. family. Yeah, that's that's true. what it's all about. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, this is the point in the show where we give away some swag to one lucky member of the Two Keto Dudes fan club. Yeah. And uh, the fan club is very easy to join. Just go to fanclub.2keto.com and answer a yep. few questions. And mm -hmm. every show we pick somebody at random. And today's winner is none other than Danita Goodwin. Oh, congratulations, Danita. Yeah. And Danita Goodwin, we'll be sending you a coffee mug with our mugs on it that says Keep Calm and Keto On. And uh, you can put your favorite bulletproof or not coffee in there and drink it in our honor. Yeah. You know, if you don't want to wait uh, to win a mug, uh, you can't wait for the lottery, you can always go buy one at gear.2keto.com and pick yourself up a T-shirt while you're at it. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, my friend. It's time for that little segment, that happy little time we call... <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was going to be better than our framework there for a moment. <laughs> yeah, I know it really. <laughs> Everybody's like, that's "What the hell is he talking about?" That's an inside joke for the developers in our audience. Okay, Carl, what do you got? And there are many. Well, okay, so last week we talked to Kevin Mountain and Brenda Zorn, yeah. and it was yeah. such an awesome show. Mm. So just. Today, earlier today, Kevin Mountain posted a picture of his blood glucose at 91. Wow. That's normal. That's totally normal. normal. Yeah. Totally normal. Yeah, three months of that, and he's going to have an A1C down in the range of five. Uh, yeah. And he was on insulin, a lot of it, as you remember. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. A hundred units a day or something. Yeah. And he says, also, my belt is way too big now. It's on the last <laughs> hole. Time for new belt. Kevin, if you actually get a drill 
Yeah. You know, a power drill? Zzz, and you can drill holes in your belt. Or you can punch it out with an awl, too. <laughs> you don't need a power drill. If you got either. an awl, yep. yep. <laughs> so, one thing interesting, Brenda said that uh, Native Americans uh, have heard the show and are contacting Kevin directly with uh, asking yeah. for advice. People he's never heard of out of the blue are saying, you know, what are you doing? My mother or my father or I'm diabetic or I'm on dialysis and and what do you what can you tell me about so he's becoming a, a, a I guess a, a, a signpost in his community which is awesome outstanding it is awesome and you know mm. he's eating at Brenda's house there you go <laughs> well I think they're both <laughs> eating at their house so yeah yeah so, that's right Brenda- they bought a house together didn't they yeah they, they moved in mm-hmm. yeah Fantastic. Well, anyway, congratulations, Kevin. It's normal. Everything's back to normal in your yeah. loving life. And congrats to Brenda, too. Yeah. Uh, you, I don't know. So, Richard, you got some mail to share? Yes, I actually I do. And this mail is from a fella called Richard Morris. <laughs> you might <laughs> have heard of. I know that guy. <laughs> 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 okay. So, this was in the uh, ketogenic forums. Uh, and somebody posted uh, that they were having inconsistent success on one meal a day, low-carb, healthy fat. Mm. And somebody in the thread said, ask yourself why Richard and Carl are, and others are so big in intermittent fasting, which is just the ultimate version of caloric deficit. And this was an argument uh. for cal- calorie deficit. And so this is my post. Um, and I really, I'm really calling back to something Jason Fung said on his Obesity Code podcast. Yeah. Um, and uh, Jason Fung explained the difference between calorie restriction and intermittent fasting in a recent uh, uh, podcast using an reductio absurdum. That's where you take a point to its illogical conclusion and uh, show that it doesn't make sense. So here it is. Imagine you and your twin are both going to eat just 1,200 calories a day. Now, most of us need 1,500 to 2,500 calories a day. So um, you, you and your twin are not going to eat enough for the day. Okay, Mm. so in your case, you spread it out during the day. So every hour you eat another 50 calories. And what happens uh, for you is every hour you give your insulin a little nudge up because there's there's new food coming in and you need some insulin to use that food and that turns off access to body fat. Right. Normally when you eat, your insulin goes up and then a couple of hours after eating, your insulin drops down and then you can use your body fat again. Right. But because you're eating every hour, you never access body fat. The right. total energy in your circulation for that day was 1,200 calories. So now your body has to budget for that and it has to furlough multiple optional processes. Um, it's going to be a pretty nasty day for you and you're going to feel lethargic and hungry the entire day because – your dietary budget has dropped from 2,500, for example, to 1,200. Right. And as Jason says, the key is insulin, which is sort of like a switch. And when right. insulin is up, you cannot mm-hmm. access body fat. And when it's down, you can. And if you keep it up all the time by by having multiple meals, then, then your access to your own reserves are deprived. Now, here's the thing. Your twin eats just one meal a day. So he has only 1,200 calories as well. But he does it all in one meal. And he also nudges his insulin. He probably nudges his insulin more than you did. Mm. But a few hours after eating, his insulin goes low again. And now he's able to use his body fat for energy. And he might get an additional 1,200 calories from body fat for that day. That's right. So not only is he going to weigh less on the scale, he's also going to have an awesome day with a budget of 2,400 calories of energy. Right. The thing is that there is a big difference between the amount of calories that you eat and the amount of calories you have available. And it all depends right. on insulin. And yes. uh, our, our bodies apparently treat not enough calories differently than they treat none at all, which is the case for fasting. Right. Yeah. Very good. Very nice so, way to put it. So that's my mail. Awesome. And uh, that brings us to our very special guest, uh, Dr. Asim Malhotra, who we caught up with in New York. We did. Yeah. And we're just going to play the recording that we made while we were in our hotel room there. So roll the tape. Well, uh, we are here in a little hotel room. All hotel rooms in New York City are little, yeah. unless you're, you're Donald Trump, I guess. But, right. uh, and uh, Asim Malhotra <laughs> is here with us. Hi, Asim. Hi. Carl. It's great to meet you. Yeah. We're, really great to meet you. We're huge fans. Absolutely. Getting smaller. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Slowly. 
slowly. slowly getting smaller. Yeah, so you're in New York to launch your new book. Yes, uh, Richard, uh, The P.O.P. Diet, which okay. is uh, a kind of a book based upon a documentary film. Usually things happen the other way around. Right. Uh, yeah. um, film comes off the book, but um, it's uh, The Big Fat Fix, which we mm -hmm. release myself and my co-author, Donald O'Neill, who is a background as being a former international Irish athlete, Northern right. Irish athlete. And, Great film, uh, by the way. I'm glad you really liked it. I'm glad you liked it. It was it was fun making it, and it was nice seeing the final product. Um, mm. And then we thought we should produce a book, which really kind of goes into a bit of depth on the science behind what constitutes, you know, uh, living in a healthy way, understanding yeah. what causes heart disease, addressing some issues around cholesterol, mm. uh, and then produce a plan, you know, a practical mm, plan that sure. people could follow. Yeah, you know, that makes sense. That is going to get them into good health in a relatively short space of time because the science tells us that lifestyle changes actually right. the impact on health is very rapid and it's nothing to do with weight loss weight loss is a side effect yeah right? so it's just trying to get the also you know get people thinking differently um and it's done, so far done really well in the uk mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. we were officially a bestseller last week we were number three on amazon which is great that's you know, amazing for, um above jk rowling which i was you know wow. surprised by but um <laughs> but i think for me personally as well i come from uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a campaigner and, you know, I, uh, I'm interested in population health mm. because, you know, the system is failing, oh, failing yes. us. The yes. healthcare system is under a lot of pressure. Yeah. And, you know, I uh, come to the realization personally that for me, you know, I want to help improve the system. Our individual health and happiness is actually to a significant degree dependent on collective health and happiness. Mm. Great. So, you know, for society to benefit, then I think we all benefit as individuals. Of course, yeah. individuals need advice and they want to get better. But, you know, it's um, uh, intervening at a policy level for me, which is what I've been trying to do. And the book yes. was even mentioned in Parliament by a, a guy who's a chair of the All-Party Diabetes mm -hmm. uh, mm. Committee, uh, an MP called, a member of Parliament called uh, Keith Vaz, you know, calling on members of parliament with the highest uh, prevalence of type 2 diabetes in their constituencies the uh, the top 100 he says you know you guys should all follow the piopi diet which is yeah. great yeah so hitting policy makers i think is is really important as well for me yeah, so uh, the book is a vehicle for for uh, leveraging policy is that it, really? it, so it's for individuals uh mm. richard as well as policy so for mm. me you know having the impact at a policy level would be give me the greatest satisfaction. You know, right. I, I said to a, a journalist when it was, go, you know, it was covered in in, um, in various newspapers in the UK. Mm -hmm. I said I'd rather the book sell ten thousand copies and influence policy <laughs> than yeah. sell a million copies and that not happen. Because Absolutely. we're looking at systemic change that needs to happen Absolutely. in order for people to get better. Absolutely, uh, Carl. And it's about. Um, it's also about. A, a, you know, I call it a revolution in healthcare and in, 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 in the way we practice medicine as well. It's not just yeah. about, you know, it's a, there needs to be that shift because as you guys know, you know, the current uh, model is one of treating illness with or symptoms yeah. with drugs of dubious benefit. And we can talk a little bit about that um, without addressing the root causes. Right. And in general, the imbalance we have right now is we have an over-medicated population, mm -hmm. whether it's in the United States or UK, most of the Western world, um, over-medicated. And at the same time, we are detracting from simple lifestyle changes mm. that people can make that is going to make them improve their quality of life as well as their longevity. Right. There, it used to be that a symptomatic treatment was a pejorative in medicine. Yeah. That, you know, if you accuse somebody of, of, of making symptomatic treatments, you're accusing them of, of papering over the cracks. Yeah. I, I'm just curious where this changed because it seems to be in last, maybe the last 40 or 50 years that medicine moved from a patient-centric model to, I guess, pharmaceuticals and heroic surgery and mm. expensive hospitals. And Richard, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, I think what we need to do is take a step back and I, I, I've started – when I give my talks, I, I start from what does evidence-based medicine, which right. is what we want to practice, what does yeah. it actually be? What, how do we, let's define it first mm. and foremost. And then we can work out where we've gone wrong. And uh, a man who's considered a, a Canadian physician called uh, David Sackett, yeah. he's considered one of the fathers of evidence-based medicine. And the three components to improving outcomes mm -hmm. for patients, that's what we're here to do. For me, my, you know, my, my main primary duty is to look after my patients, do what's best for them and improve their health. Mm. And the three things he talk about are 
individual clinical expertise, which is something you gain with experience. Yes. Um, best external available evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We can come back to that because Mm -hmm. there's lots of issues Mm -hmm. with that. And third, but most importantly, which is what we've neglected, is um, making decisions based upon patient preference, their preferences and values. Oh, okay. And we have neglected that. And you you hit about the pharmaceutical industry. What's happened in the last two decades is that there's been more and more control being exerted by industry, much more commercial influence on medicine. And we Mm. seem to have forgotten actually the most important person in the room, which is the patient. Absolutely. And the patient isn't just a vehicle for you to make money on medications, in other words. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and and sadly, that's what's been happening. And more so, I know, in the States than in the UK. But, mm. you know, um, patient preferences and the values are not being taken into consideration. Mm. And the system is actually fueling a, a model that really benefits industry much you know way more than the patient. Mm. So, what we've got is a finance-based medicine model, yeah. sure. not an evidence-based mod- yeah. medicine model. And that, that's true in uh, socialized medicine in Australia and the UK as well as, as it is in America. I mean, it's, 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 definitely, uh, it's definitely driven by industry, I think. And incentives. I mean, we, we see this as a series of incentives that continue to play out and build upon themselves. And so now you have, com- you know, people whose entire livelihoods depend on the grain industry or the diabetes engine uh, or, you know, the healthcare system that is really about sick care. Mm. And and it's a challenge to, you know, everything that we're saying is a challenge to these people. And every once in a while, somebody gets smacked down, right? And uh, Tim Noakes is a perfect example. So, the thing that Richard and I are thinking about these days is in order to give the system as a with a capital S and all of the people in it an incentive to come forward and say, we were wrong that we are changing the way we are addressing diabetes, patients, and all the inflammatory diseases. In order for that to happen, we sort of have to let them off the hook for liability because, I mean, this is what they're really all afraid of. They're afraid of losing their jobs. They're afraid of being sued. Yeah, Um, I agree. I think uh, the way that we change the system is also about greater awareness. And, uh, you know, my... um, I had a realization many years ago that if things were going to really change, you know, you have to use media to get the information out there because yes. most people want to do the right thing, mm-hmm. I think, intrinsically. I agree. Sometimes their hands are tied, the system doesn't let them, or they're scared of speaking out. Mm-hmm. Um, but the way to do that is to get that to every, you know, get that to everybody, get the information out there so mm. people then realize because the way the system perpetuates itself in a negative way is when information is sequestered or held back that is important. Right. That yeah. is, is required to really change things because and it always comes out at a at a time in the future and never and it backfires on you. So why didn't you tell me this? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And we were all doing the same thing, and therefore, you know, this is uh, uh, no one, no individual is to. And I think, in a sense, no, you know, there are going to be few bad apples. There's maldistribution of resources, there's maldistribution of power, you know, and there mm. are always going to be some bad apples. There's no doubt, and in very powerful positions. Mm. Um, that can cause a lot of damage and a lot of harm yeah. um, and, and perpetuate the status quo, even though when they should, they should know better. But you mentioned about the, um, the you know, about liability and, and things coming out later on and, you know, blame and all that kind of thing. The other thing that David Sackett also said, he said 50%, you know, the father of evidence-based medicine, he said 50% yes. of what you learn in medical school will turn out to be either dead wrong or outdated within five years of your graduation. Wow. The trouble wow. is you don't know which half, <laughs> so you have to learn to learn on your own. Yeah. And that's what I have been doing in the last few years and other people around the world and my colleagues have been doing the same thing is that, you know, we look at the totality of the data. We know that certain things are working much better. We know the old model is not working very well. And actually, you know, but what's interesting is the science and the evidence alone is not sufficient. Right. Opposition from vested interests has to be overcome. Absolutely. And for me, uh, I think it, it's going to be through um, getting that information out there to as many people as possible and, right. you know, hitting the headline news. And yeah. making, And this is kind of what I've been doing for the last few years. If I think something's important, if mm. I write an article or an editorial or publish in a journal, I think, you know what, it's not just about publishing it. That's great. Mm. How can this article or this bit of information actually influence change? Yeah. And therefore... For me, um, what I've, you know, uh, been relatively successful at is making sure that information, you know, gets into the into the news, gets yeah. into the mainstream news, gets onto BBC News or gets yeah. into BBC World News or whatever. Right. And that's kind of my way of trying to make change happen. 
So speaking of information, uh, tell us about the information in the book about uh, about its prescriptions. And yeah. So I think, uh, uh, Richard, the first thing is when we look at the root causes mm -hmm. of many of these chronic diseases, and I come from the background as a cardiologist, in some ways, I think in many ways, actually, um, cardiology or fear of heart disease is actually a root cause of the problems that we have at the moment. I mean, everything <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> comes back to LDL cholesterol. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In fact, you know, the whole Ansel Keys and his mm. seven country study and the fear of heart disease and the, the number one enemy was of cholesterol and we should do everything we can to get it down. Mm. And a multi-billion dollar food industry and drug industry has developed around this fear of cholesterol. Yeah. Right. So, actually, this is what the book really tries to address. But also, we know Mm -hmm. that actually the number one risk factor for heart attacks and linked to high blood pressure, precursor of type 2 diabetes, independently linked to dementia and many cancers yeah. is insulin resistance. Absolutely. Yes. So, the book really starts from that you know, premise that insulin resistance is a problem. Mm -hmm. What are the different things you can do in terms of lifestyle that can address insulin resistance? Mm. So, that means diet, which... Mm -hmm in the hierarchy of, of, of things is probably the most important. You know, mm. the Lancet Global Burden of Disease Report suggests that poor diet is responsible for more disease and death globally now than physical inactivity, smoking and alcohol combined. Wow. So, diet has to be the first most Absolutely. important target. Wow. Um, and then the other things that, you know, it, in the, the um, worsen insulin resistance and are linked to chronic inflammation, yeah. which is things like stress, poor sleep, um, you know, sedentary lifestyles. And sedentary doesn't mean that you have to spend lots of money and spend hours pounding the gym. It basically means don't sit for prolonged periods of time. Right. right. And, you know, walking is probably one of the best things you can do for your longevity. Yeah. So, <laughs> some really simple messages there. Mm. Um, and then we combine it all together to give people a plan saying, well, listen, if you do this and you, you, know, you adopt all of these things together, then you're going to be much better health. Yeah. So I appreciate the fact that there aren't any products in your list, <laughs> you know? <laughs> There's nothing we have to buy to, yeah. to no, achieve. I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I think one of the other, yeah, so uh, to try and keep it as clean as possible because, you know, right. it happens where there are, you know, people endorse products and they get money right, and sure. I know how, why this happens, but we have to, you know, we, myself and Donald O'Neill, my co-author, wanted to come from a position, okay, well, you know, I mean, I, I'll be honest with you, I was offered a lot of money to give a talk um, uh, by an olive oil company. Mm -hmm. I said, listen, I, I, I think mm -hmm. olive oil is great, but yes. I, I'm sorry, but I will not, you know, I right. just can't. I have to, the perception, everything has to be clean. And right. uh, I said, well, I will not, you know, and this is part of, you know, who I am right. is that, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's drug company sponsored or food industry sponsored stuff, I will not, you know, endorse Because the problem is you get a mixed message. You get, you get some truth. You know, you get some things that are really true and then, and hey, while you're at it, buy my stuff. No, exactly. <laughs> so, but, you know, when I, when I talk about the positives of the Mediterranean diet, which are likely right. to be anti-inflammatory and, and actually, mm. which goes into actually, you know, what heart disease is, yeah. a chronic inflammatory condition. Sure. You know, those foods where there seems to be consistent evidence is, mm -hmm. you know, the extra virgin olive oil, mm -hmm. handful of nuts every day. Avocados lots, and lots of non starchy sardines. vegetables, absolutely, mm. and uh, oily fish mm -hmm. and the omega 3s and all of that. And that, you know, where we are right now, science evolves, that totality of data suggests that this is where the benefits are. Yeah. And of course, cutting out the refined carbs right. and the sugar, you know, and the stuff in the middle, the rest of it doesn't mm -hmm. matter so much as long as you're doing that. Yeah, it's almost more important to not eat the inflammatory foods as yeah. it is to eat anti inflammatory seed oils, yeah. trans fats, hydrogenated seed oils, yeah. absolutely. All these things. It, Most carbs. Well, once you get to <laughs> as deranged as Carl and I got to, yeah. any kind of carbs are going to derange you further. So sure. it's mm -hmm. something that, you know, at our point, we lack the ability really to, to respond to high glucose with insulin. So, we have to respond to low glucose with a very clever liver. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Your, uh, your book and the movie, The Big Fat Fix, both center around a village in Italy, right? Can you tell me the story of how you came upon this village? Yeah, and so it's interesting. So, Pioppi is a village in southern Italy in the province of Salerno, so it's southwest Italy. Mm. And uh, it's about an hour and a half drive from Naples. And this village... Um, was actually become famous now, I suppose, but in many ways had a lot of history because Ansel Keys spent around uh, six months of the year for 30 years of his life living in this village and he conducted a lot of his research out of there. Hmm. And he just loved the place yeah. and he actually had his house there. And so, we went to the village because it was also, um, you know, it's one of the pr protected homes of the Mediterranean diet. Mm. 
and they're, uh, they have very, you know, good longevity and healthy lifespan. So they're nice. living to old age healthily. And they still eat the same diet they've been eating for. Yeah, very, very, pretty much very similar. But what we mm. did was we also spoke to, um, you know, some of the locals. In fact, the, uh, the son of the, of Ansel Keys' driver. So Ansel Keys' driver actually became a very close family friend. So they knew each other very well. Wow. In the time when Ansel Keys was around. And they would, we, we talked about what was traditional diet. And, you know, they haven't ve- veered much away from that now mm. at all. It's still very similar. And, uh, we spent some time in the village speaking to the locals, observing being part of that, you know, that right. environment and feeling it and eating the food. And right. we wanted to get that you know, that village, there's so much history there, obviously, mm. with Ansel Keys. And then what was it about how do we combine the secrets of the village with what we know about modern, up-to-date right. literature and nutrition and, and modern medicine, and then marry the two together to produce right. this plan? And, uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting things I discovered, you know, for example, the pasta. Now, people in the Western world, they think Italian diet, lots and lots of pasta. Yeah. Um, Traditionally, Italians, um, and I know this also because I have Italian friends and I used to date a girl who was Italian. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Italians never had pasta really as a main course. As it a was main all, course. It was always a starter. Yeah. And it, obviously with the olive oil, which changes the glycemic index as well. Uh-huh. And uh, in the village, you know, we asked them how often do you have pizza? And it was once or twice a month. Mm. Sugar, dessert only on Sundays. Mm. So, when you think about that, mm. you know, that they're eating and they're all very locally sourced vegetables and, you know, cheeses and oily fish and that kind of right. thing. Um, you know, there was no sort of processed snacking, processed carbohydrate stuff. And they were lo- always outside and walking around and not a lot of, you know, transportation. No, other than- no, absolutely. And there, there are no gyms in this village yet. The average... Uh, you know, average villager lives almost 10 years more than the average Tour de France cyclist. Wow. <laughs> you know, no prescribed <laughs> exercise. They're just yeah. walking everywhere. Yeah, Absolutely hilly, right. right. But actually, when you look at the data on, you mentioned walking. I mean, I look at walking and heart disease. It may well be there's some suggestion that walking could be more, actually more protective against heart disease than running. Wow. And it may be because running also adds an extra stress on the body, which walking mm. doesn't. But just brisk walking, you know, if you can do 150 minutes a week. Sure. Of just walking, you know, 30 minutes, whatever, five times a week, then right. that in itself when it comes to longevity is as good as anything. And we found, right, Richard, that w- after we, we lost a lot of weight without doing it, I did, without doing a lot of exercise. But there was one point, and you remember this, right? That's yeah. like, I'm sitting there and all of a sudden, I have to get up and run up a flight of stairs. Like, I have to do, like, all, my body is telling me, it's time to move. We've got some energy to, and I hadn't had that signal since I was a kid. And and so, you know, the order of things for me was you lose the weight with uh, by cutting out the carbohydrates and the bad food. Of course. And then all of a sudden, it's just going to happen to you. You're going to want to move. Mm. A lot of it, I think, happens when we lower insulin. All of a sudden, we have access to energy that we didn't sure. have before. We can get it out of our body fat and we can get it into our mitochondria and that's all sort of... And, and I think the other thing as well, is, as you know, is insulin also, you know, the way that the metabolism is that when insulin's high, then it also interferes with your appetite control mechanisms mm, and right. this constant feeling of hunger yeah. that you get. I mean, and you know, I, I actually speak from a personal perspective as well because although I was never particularly overweight, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I had this extra belly fat and mm-hmm. I used to play a lot of sport and I kept in sports teams at school and university. Yeah. Um, but I was always hungry and I was, a, you know, I was gorging on sugar. Yeah. You know, I calculated when I look back roughly, I was probably consuming for at least 10 or 15 years, if not longer, 40, four zero teaspoons of sugar a day. Wow. You know, it was typical sugared cereal in the morning, orange juice. Yeah, you know, I'd go to the gym for my 5K run, then mm-hmm. I'd have some Lucozade. Yep. Mid-morning snack, about 10.30 morning, I'd have a, a candy bar, chocolate bar, Kit Kat. Mm-hmm. Then I'd get hungry, you know, lunch, I'd be starving. I'd go right. for, you know, I'd get my panini and some pasta. Yeah. Wow. About two hours later, I'd start to feel that crash, that sleepiness. I'd go back to um, the coffee shop and I'd get a yeah. mocha with yeah. extra chocolate in there. Honestly, this was my routine. Then in the wow. evening, I'd make chicken and rice. I love cooking, so mm-hmm. I'd have chicken and rice. Then I'd feel hungry, you know, or I'd have pasta. Right. And an hour and a half later, it's like, why am I starving after I had a huge bowl of pasta? Right. And then I'd have, you know, off, more often than not, I'd have a slice of chocolate cake. And I did this for a long time. Wow. And when I did cut out the sugar and went cold turkey on it, I was the, the, the first thing I noticed was like, ah, the craving goes and you just, mm. you don't feel as hungry as you used to. Yeah. So, uh, and I lost the belly fat. You Absolutely. Know, so, uh, <laughs> did you, did you have fatty liver? 
And um, um, I, I never had a fatty liver in terms of what was checked as such. Mm. I never had a fatty liver, but I had that kind of, you know, that that extra. And I have still have a little bit, but it was nothing like it like yeah. it was. And in fact, that brings us on to the whole issue of the, you know, uh, heart disease. Now yeah. most people who are admitted with heart attacks have metabolic syndrome. You right, know, about 69 percent of people. Mm. Which is for people listening is you know any three of the five of high triglycerides, low HDL, cholesterol. Um, high blood pressure, pre-diabetes of type 2. High blood sugar, yeah. And um, increased waist circumference. Mm -hmm. Right. And actually, that is a much better mark of your waist circumference than the whole body mass index stuff, which is basically mm. just, you know, that's yeah. it's, it's yeah. fatally flawed. And yes. we need to move away from this. And I say, as I do in the movie and I write in the book, there's no such thing as a healthy weight. Yeah. Only a healthy person. Right. Very good. Yeah, I, I, I personally, I believe once we've disassociated uh, obesity with all of the horrible diseases that go with it, like diabetes and heart disease and hypertension, once we've disassociated those, obesity is an unreliable marker for health. Because yeah. uh, in my case, um, my lean body mass is 80.5 kilograms. My, for my height, my ideal um, my ideal range is between 59 and 79 kilograms. So if I were able to magically remove all body fat, go to 0% body fat, I'd still be one and a half kilograms overweight, <laughs> so, which shows you now it's ridiculous. Yeah. You know. yeah, absolutely. I don't know if you're aware of a guy named Dave Feldman who has been doing experiments. He's a, an engineer who's been doing experiments on himself and others, and maybe 70, 80 people by yeah. now with a 85% consistency in that he's able to show that based on what you eat three days before a blood test, you can manipulate your cholesterol numbers in either direction to be either what we consider good cholesterol numbers or bad. And so, by fasting is perhaps the most dramatic way to raise your cholesterol. Fast three days before a blood test, if you fast the whole three days, your LDL is going to go way up, your trigs are going to go way up, your HDL is going to go way down. And if you do the inverse, if you eat 5,000 calories of avocados and macadamia nuts for three days and heavy cream and butter and bacon, it goes in exactly the opposite direction dramatically. And so, what he's showing here is that a cholesterol test isn't a marker of, you know, like an HbA1c, like something that is an average over three months. It's very dynamic. And most people are conditioned before they have a blood test to be good. So, they might cut back on, you know, calories and lower their, what they eat, which pushes their cholesterol up, which raises the potential for them to be prescribed medications. And um, he even has people who follow him at cholesterolcode.com say that they use this technique to lower their cholesterol before a blood test to get better rates on their insurance. Wow, that's really interesting. Isn't that? I'm, yeah, very interesting. Shocking, I would, yeah. I did the test myself and I, I, I'm right in that camp. Wow. My cholesterol dropped like 200 points Wow. between the two tests. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely mind-blowing. I think, yeah, I think this focus on cholesterol really needs to shift, um, mm. to mm. be honest. I think the... You know, we, we know that triglycerides HDL generally yeah. on average is 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 actually um, the much better predictor. And in mm. fact, that also is a marker of insulin resistance as well, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But, you know, I think that, as you know, the body is complex and, you know, I, we, we shouldn't just use one specific marker. We look at, look at the totality of it. Right. But what's interesting as well with um, cholesterol is I'm seeing patients who are coming to me who, you know, have had very genetically very high cholesterol levels. Yeah. And they're getting to the stage now where their doctor's saying, listen, I think you should go on a stand and they're 50. And I'm like, well, okay, well, some of them have had calcium scores done mm. or CT coronary angiograms. Right. Yeah. And they come back completely clear. Yeah. And most of the cholesterol that you produce, you know, is, is genetic. Mm -hmm. um, you can vary it slightly by diet, but, it, you know, there is a strong genetic, you know, where the level's going to be or the range is going to be. Mm -hmm. If high cholesterol for you, um, you know, if you've had high cholesterol most of your life and you're 50 plus, um, if it's going to cause heart disease, there will be coronary atheroma. Yeah. In, in other words, by 50, it would have happened already. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Uh, the thing I like about the calcium score is it's actually looking at the disease. It's not looking at a proxy mm. for a weak association for the yes. disease. Yeah. It's actually looking at the actual disease happening yeah. itself. I mean, I had a calcium score done because uh, I had um, high LDL and I was concerned and, um, and mine came back zero. So even though I was diabetic, um, mm. my doctor said that still gives you – Roughly 10 years warranty against heart disease and come back in 10 years' time and get another one done and we'll make sure that you're, you know, But now, if, if I hear what you're saying, you know, you're over 50, you made it. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, that's uh, maybe, but I, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, between 50 and, you know, 70 or 80, yeah. though, I suppose that you're more insulin resistant as well. So, sure. yeah, I think the older you get, mm. the more you know, conscious you have to be about these things Yeah. if you're worried about your health. So, speaking of uh, heart disease and cholesterol, cholesterol, we and we say this all the time when we talk about it on our show, has to be the most misunderstood marker of anything in the history of medicine and, and still to this day. Um, how is it that when you reduce your carbohydrates and you, you, you reduce your blood sugar and your body weight and all of these and your blood pressure and all of these great things happen to you and all your numbers look good except for one. <laughs> Why is that? Is your body stupid? <laughs> and that's what the doctors are telling you basically that I don't understand, but here, take the statin and reduce that cholesterol. And nobody is thinking, and especially doctors are thinking, our present company ex excluded, um, maybe we have this marker wrong. Yeah, uh, I think you're right. We have got it. We've got it very, very badly wrong, actually. And I start now telling my patients to stop fearing cholesterol. Um, I'll address exactly what you're talking about in a second, um, Carl, because I think you've, you've hit some very important points there around, you know, all of these other markers getting better. Actually, for cholesterol, when you reduce the carbs and the sugar in general, generally the profile does improve. Um, but for some people, it, it, you know, there's LDL or whatever else, the bad mm. cholesterol may go up. Mm. But one, uh, I was involved in some research published last year um, with 16 international scientists. We did a systematic review looking at people aged over the age of 60 specifically. And the association of LDL, so-called bad cholesterol and heart disease. And what we found, and it was published in BMJ Open, uh, and it made news in, in the UK, uh, was pretty extraordinary. We found that if you're over 60... And by the way, the reason we looked at over 60 um, was partly because most people who have heart attacks are over 60. Yeah, yeah. the data. Yeah. Um, but uh, there was no association, no association whatsoever between LDL cholesterol and heart disease and an inverse association with all-cause mortality. In other mm. words, the higher your LDL, the less likely you are to die. And uh, I remember a patient coming to see me. I mean, this happens, you know, relatively often who has been, the fear of God has been put into the patient who's been told by their family practitioner that my cholesterol's high and ladies over 60s. And That's right. I said, congratulations, you're going to live longer. Yeah. And she left my <laughs> consultation with a smile on her face and I explained it all to her. And the mechanism, it's not that well understood, but it's most likely because, you know, as we know, cholesterol has so many functions in the body right. mm -hmm. that are really essential yeah. and we die without cholesterol, whether it's, you know, maintaining the integrity of cell membranes, hormone mm. production, neurological function. But one of the other uses, if you like, or, you know, why cholesterol is important is also it's involved in the immune system. Right. And it's thought that actually in the people with higher LDLs who are elderly are protected against um, life-threatening infections such as wow. pneumonia, which is what elderly people, a lot of elderly people get yeah. you know, vulnerable to and can yeah. die from. Yeah. So, that's probably the mechanism. But what it does tell us, and listen, no, no um, you know, a lot of this research is never absolutely perfect, mm. but at the very least, it tells you it's a very, very weak risk factor for that. And when you look at the original association studies framing them, right. which mm -hmm. is this, you know, population in Massachusetts who have followed up for decades, a lot of studies were done on that population, yeah. looking at cholesterol as a risk factor, you know, and I only discovered this relatively recently, and I thought this is really interesting, is that um, the association of heart disease was only present when your total cholesterol was above, in UK terms, we say 10. I don't know what the, the equivalent would right. be in the US. Um, LDL, though, was only associated with heart disease when it was above 190 or 4.9. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the overwhelming majority of patients that I see don't have an LDL to that level. Mm. 
Um, and even then, you know, when you look at the risk factors, it's still much further down the list when you compare it to insulin resistance and high blood pressure and body mass index and triglycerides and HDL and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, it comes much further down. Now, on the other side of it is then the reason why there's a whole industry and I want to talk about statins as well and, sure. and cholesterol alone drugs. The reason why there's still a intellectual mindset or conflict of interest or what do you want, whatever you want to call it. Uh, on the lower the cholesterol, the better is that there is, you know, in Framingham cohort, the people who had low cholesterol um, tended to have much less heart disease on the other, on the other extreme. Mm. And, um, but half of those people also had genetically or didn't develop high blood pressure either. So, it could be the blood pressure, it could be something genetic. But there's something else I would add in there. Even if that's the case, it's very different that somebody genetically, because most cholesterol really is genetically produced, mm. has low cholesterol. We have to understand there's something different about that compared to giving a drug to get it as low as possible. Right. And the evidence tells us the totality of the data on all of the drugs that have been produced to the modern day and the trials that have been done, both statin and non-statin drugs, a lot of those, if not most of them, did not show any benefit on reducing mortality or cardiovascular death. Mm. So, um, when we look at statins, the so-called miracle drug that people are prescribed, sure, there's a big problem with statins on many levels, mm -hmm. not least the lack of transparency in the prescription of the statins with the patient. Yeah. So, um, I'll start on that point first and foremost is that we talked about at the beginning about practicing evidence-based medicine, about giving mm -hmm. patients, helping patients make a decision based upon their preferences and values. And statins is a great example to, um, to demonstrate why actually we are not practicing evidence-based medicine. Most of us are not doing this in okay. medicine. And in fact, I would say are practicing unwittingly unethical medicine in the prescription of statins. I say that, you know, I, I get up in conferences and say this is unethical medicine yeah. to do this and to scaremonger and patients patient taking statins without actually telling them what the true benefits are. Right. Part of that is because the doctors themselves don't know. So, you've got misinformed doctor, misinformed patient. So, let me give you an example of statins. So, sure. if you've had a heart attack, I've, I've prescribed statins to thousands of thousands of, of patients in my career mm -hmm. uh, as an interventional cardiologist and you treat people for heart attacks and then you know you go around and the ward around and you say this is a pretty much you tell them this is a magic pill you must take this every day you know it's going to save your life but what does the data actually tell us and this data we have to also take with a pinch of salt because it's all almost all of it is industry drug industry sponsored data mm. no can we one, actually look at the underlying data or is that still commercial and confidence? No, exactly. That's the other problem. So, it's never been independently verified. Ah. Mm. And uh, But even if we look at that at face value, if you have a heart attack or have established heart disease, taking a statin every day for five days, there's a 1 in 83 chance it will delay or prevent your death. Right. About 1 in 39, it will prevent a recurrent heart attack. Mm. But most patients are not told this. And if you haven't got, if you're not a high risk of heart disease and you're low risk and which actually is about 75% of all people taking statins around the world are in this category. Wow. You're not going to so live high. one day longer. Right. You're not going to live one day longer from taking a statin. There's a one in, you know, less than 1% chance it will prevent a non-fatal heart attack or, or, or a stroke that doesn't cause significant disability. And most patients are not given this information. That's before you even get into the side effects. Now, what's yeah. interesting is that, that this is trial data on people who adhered to statins in the trials and took them every day. Wow. But the reality is when you look at real world data, and this is before any of the recent hyper and statins and all the so-called you know, this so-called awareness of the side effects. So, you go mm. back 2002, study published in JAMA, looked at people over the age of 65 who had heart disease or heart attacks and prescribed statins. And in less than two years, only 40% of those patients were taking a statin. Now, I find that extraordinary hmm. because I know the mindset of the doctor and the patient that I have been there telling the patient and not mentioning side effects saying this is a magic pill. Hmm. Why are most people stopping their statin? Side effects. When, you, look side at, effect. when you do surveys, they, they say most Whatever. of them say the, the most common reason they, they cite is because of side effects. So, you know, it, it's easy to understand then when you look at the real world data, people think, okay, statins have reduced mortality in the population. That's, that, the science doesn't tell us that that's the yeah. case at all. In fact, there was again a study published in the BMJ that looked at have uh, statins reduced cardiovascular death in Western European countries with an increased uptake over many years, and they haven't. Mm. But that's very, it's actually easy to understand that when you look at the data because another way of analyzing the statistics is to say if you take an average 
Okay, we only know that a small percentage of people benefit. But if you take an average of a, of a group of people in the trials for secondary prevention for mm. heart disease, mm -hmm. how much longer on average did they, do they live if right. they take a statin every day for five years? Right. And the answer is, and when I tell patients this, they are absolutely flabbergasted. Even doctors I speak to who are academics, who are not, you know, who are not knowledgeable in this specific area, are shocked. Four and a half days. Wow. So, if you What? think about that, if you're the, in the trial... You're the selected group of people who didn't get side effects that adhered to the medication for five years. The average increase, the median increase in life expectancy taking statin every day for five years is four and a half days. Wow. Now, wow. that's information I would want to know Absolutely. myself. Yeah. Yeah. And I would want to make a decision. And some people will say, okay, I'll take a statin and some people won't. But we're not doing that. And right. by not doing that, I'm, it's completely unethical practice. Right. Yeah. Unethical practice of medicine. From what I understand about a statin... Uh, its mechanism is to suppress the liver's generation of cholesterol? Yeah, it works by suppressing something called HMG co uh, um, right. reductase. It's reductase. A, yeah. I, I think that people are under the misguided idea that it somehow removes cholesterol, you know, dietary cholesterol, whatever cholesterol from your bloodstream, that it really has nothing yeah, to do with what you eat. it suppresses the actual manufacture of cholesterol in the liver, but... Yeah. Is that the only thing that well, it does? So, well, I published a, an editorial in the British Medical Journal in 2013 called Saturated Fat is Not the Major Issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it was press released by the BMJ and it made, you know, I was, I think reflect now, I think pleasantly surprised. I was happy that it got out there, but it was, I didn't expect it to have the impact it did. It was a front page of three newspapers in the UK. That's it was great. BBC well, Headline that, News. Yeah. It yeah. went around the world. I was speaking to Fox News Chicago and right. CNN International and most of the focus about saturated fat, but also... So, in that, I wrote about the fact we've over-medicated millions of people on stands yeah. by not, obviously, the, the numbers needed to treat, even mm. in secondary prevention, uh, and making that apparent. But actually, from my own analysis of the data, because only every other non-statin cholesterol-lowering drug never showed any significant benefit at all on cardiovascular mortality or all-cause mortality. Mm. Um, and actually, there was some research and data suggesting that statins benefits are anti-inflammatory probably anti-inflammatory so i think that actually in my view the benefit of stands and we don't know you know i think this one in 83 figure is probably an exaggeration i think when you look at it in the real world for most people it's going to be a lot less than one in 83 benefiting sure if you take an unselected you know population mm. you start off and to be honest what i start saying to my patients now is that you know when you talk about numbers needed to treat or the absolute risk reduction of 183 i say if you're able to tolerate a statin with no side effects yeah you know, then that's the best case scenario for you. Sure. And, you know, that should also take away from the fear mongering because if you're suffering disabling symptoms from statins, this fear that, oh, you must never stop your statin, you could die. Well, actually, you could argue that the risk of you dying if you're actually getting a side effect from the statin, and of often, sometimes we don't know that for sure, mm. it's probably zero from stopping the statin. Mm. Because if you were that patient that got disabling side effect, you wouldn't have continued to be in the trial right. or you would have You're been right. taken out beforehand. Well, uh, so, therefore, yeah. this risk is saying, oh, people will die of stopping their statins because of side effects. Yeah. That's unscientific nonsense as well. Yeah. Was, am I right in remembering that there was some bill introduced in the United States to actually put statins in the drinking water? No, it was somebody was, was, uh, that, uh, somebody was saying we should use it. I think you'll find Snopes will say there would never was such a thing. But right. some wits were... Uh, opining that maybe we should sell statins as a condiment at McDonald's. <laughs> so, you can have mustard, you have ketchup, yeah. and you have statins. <laughs> and you see, the thing is, that comes from a mindset of a very poor understanding about yeah. actually the impact of diet on health. Mm. And for many years, it's only until recently, and the public and doctors thought that your cholesterol was a reflection of your diet. Right. Your total cholesterol. Yeah, yeah. Um, when in fact, actually, when you look at the mechanisms from trials where diet is beneficial, it's nothing to do with cholesterol. Right. So, the Leon Hart study yes. was a, a secondary prevention Mediterranean diet study um, done in, in France. And what they found uh, was that in people with heart disease who adopted a Mediterranean diet versus the American Heart Association standard low-fat diet, which actually in itself is a relatively healthy diet compared to what a lot of people eating in the modern Western world you sure. know, in terms of all the processed food. Mm -hmm. Not that perfect diet, but certainly not the worst. A Mediterranean diet in comparison to that, people with heart disease showed a mortality reduction of 1 in 30, 1 in um, uh, 18 for recurrent heart attack. You know, it was a very strong benefit. 
And um, when you look at the cholesterol between the two groups, there was no difference at all. <laughs> and the wow. same thing was replicated when they did a primary prevention study more recently, published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2013, mm. which was looking at high-risk patients, some with type 2 diabetes, sure. and following them up over four or five years. And it was basically a, a, a standard low-fat, relatively low l advice to follow a low fat Mediterranean diet, although the total fat consumption was about 37% yeah. versus a higher fat Mediterranean diet of 41% uh, of total calories from fat, which was supplemented with either four tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil or a handful of nuts every day. Yeah. And that showed about a significant reduction in strokes, specifically about 61, hmm. NNT of 61. And again, no difference in cholesterol between wow. the two groups. So, when you look at all of it together and you know that the association is weak and you yeah. have all this other data and you know all of the other cholesterol and drugs, it's very clear yeah. that the whole focus on I need to get my cholesterol as low as possible by all these different mechanisms, cholesterol lowering foods and drugs is completely the wrong approach and in yeah. fact has caused considerable harm. I mean, let, let, we'll talk about saturated fat and cholesterol as well. And mm. then we'll talk about stents because, the, you know, this is, I trained as an interventional cardiologist. I've done thousands of angiograms in my career, yeah. hundreds of angioplasties. So, I, you know, this was my bread and butter, if you right. pardon the term. <laughs> uh, maybe it's a, like a keto bread or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but actually, the saturated fat does vary in, its, in how it influences blood cholesterol for patient to patient or person mm. to person. Traditionally, there has been this uh, saturated fat will increase LDL and therefore there's a problem because mm -hmm. LDL is associated with heart disease, although we know mm -hmm. it's not that strong. Mm, right. But actually what was missed for all this time was actually increases HDL as well. Mm. Mm. An overall effect on cholesterol profile is neutral because when you calculate someone's risk of heart disease, traditional calculators, LDL is not in there. No. It's a total cholesterol divided by your HDL ratio. Right. So, actually, you can have somebody with a total cholesterol of, of let's just use UK figures, but mm -hmm. the people sure. get the drift. Mm -hmm. um, you can have someone with a total cholesterol of seven and has a much healthier cholesterol profile than someone with a total cholesterol of four. Mm. If their HDL is, say, the someone with cholesterol of, total cholesterol of seven is two, mm -hmm. then their ratio is 3.5, seven divided by two. Right. Right. Someone with a total cholesterol of four could have an HDL of one. Right. And therefore mm. their ratio is four. Mm. Yeah. You get me? So this is actually what's being missed here. And um, saturated fat, even when you look at very good, high quality observational studies in both people who don't have heart disease or healthy and people with heart disease, you know, there's no association. There's it's no complete nonsense. Saturated fat does not clog the arteries. It's mm. completely been debunked. And in fact, I wrote uh, another editorial with two very eminent cardiologists. Don't take my word for it. Professor Rita Redberg, who's a practicing cardiologist, she's editor of JAMA Internal Medicine. Wow. And Pascal Meyer, right. who's editor of BMJ Open BMJ, Heart. BMJ, yeah. Mm. And we wrote an, uh, an editorial in British on Sports Medicine mm. uh, a few months ago. Mm -hmm. And it was entitled, Saturated Fat Does Not clog the arteries. Right. <laughs> Coronary artery disease is a chronic inflammatory condition yeah. that can be, you know, resolved, attenuated by simple lifestyle changes. Yeah. So, we need to make sure that the people just stop spouting that nonsense. So, let's talk about stents. So, if you're having a heart attack, then uh, a stent is life-saving. Mm -hmm. And the mechanism for that is essentially that you are unblocking a blocked artery that's a completely occluded. And the numbers needed to treat for that is around 40. So, with everything else that's going on, with you getting rushed to the emergency room or the, the theater or, you know, having nursing care and the pills we're putting you on all in the acute situation, having a stent on top of that, there's a one in 40 chance it will save your life. Now, mm. if you don't have a heart, you're not having a heart attack and you're diagnosed with just angina mm. or you're, you know, you've got some symptoms, a stent will not prolong your life or prevent a heart attack. The sad thing is, servers have shown that, and I wrote about this in, in, uh, in JAMA Internal Medicine a few years ago. 88% of patients having the procedure done think they're having it done for the very purpose that it doesn't benefit them. So, preventing mm. a heart attack and prolonging mm -hmm. their life. Right. And 43% of cardiologists, when anonymously asked, <laughs> said they would still go ahead and do the procedure even if they knew it wouldn't benefit the patient. Oh, oh, wow. And this is, you know, this is really quite sad and scandalous because the procedure itself has a one in a hundred chance that it will cause a heart attack, stroke or death. Oh. And I've seen people in my career wow. that I thought, now, does the... Does giving the information to patients change the decision-making process? Absolutely. Yes. So, a study was shown that as opposed to 70% of patients opting for the procedure when not told about the lack of benefit in terms of prognosis, yeah. 
that reduced to around 45% when they were told that. So, 25% hmm. reduction, absolute reduction. So, that gives us the perverse incentive not to tell people, not to inform people. Exactly. There is a hmm. system where hmm. essentially cardiologists are paid or the system encourages over-treatment and therefore that information is held back and that's just wrong. Yeah. Um, and, I, I, you know, I think that's really important that people should know that information needs to get out there. Yeah. Um, because, you know, you could argue that if a complication was to occur, and you would have changed the decision to not have a stent if you were told that, right. you know, then, you know, I should, we should, should, should the cardiologist be sued by the patient if a complication occurred? Right. I could argue a case I think that should happen. Yeah. Mm. You consider it to be a malpractice? I think so. Right. If a complication was to occur, right. indeed, you yeah. know, and they it, were not informed, and they were not informed, and that would have changed the decision. Now, stents can be used for people with uh, treating angina symptoms when medical therapy has failed, mm. but the data tells us actually that benefit only lasts for maybe a maximum of a year compared to medical therapy anyway, and you have to take the tablets irrespective. Mm, sure. So I think there is a role, and I think there's a nuance, and some people may have disease which is so severe or critical or whatever else, and they're getting a lot of symptoms. So that's fine, mm. but they should even in that situation they should still be told this and this is not going to improve your prognosis based upon the data we have and there's very good strong data telling us that mm. but it will you know improve your symptoms or i personally feel that it's important to do this that's fine and that nuance can exist but for most people that that doesn't happen that conversation doesn't happen what's the most amazing regression of disease you've ever seen in a patient i think people being diagnosed and and, and changing their diet and um their type 2 diabetes coming off medications blood pressure pills i've seen patients who have come off blood pressure pills having been on them for many years yeah um within a few months i yeah. was just cutting out the carbs which is extraordinary but we know the mechanism is because of insulin resistance and yeah. about 50 percent of blood pressure at least is because of insulin resistance so i think that's extraordinary but what amazes me most and what inspires me are my patients is the patients who are empowering themselves and coming to me yeah and saying i've got fed up with this i'm miserable on my drugs yeah they have ignored their own doctor's advice yeah and they have themselves by their own reading that's us have, have, have improved their health and i think they these people should be admired yeah you know? have you ever seen reversal of heart disease kidney disease i've never seen reversal of heart disease i've never seen two consecutive angiograms where there's been a regression of coronary atheroma but there is right. some data out there that there are um, there's a guy in India um, who has, is, is putting people through sort of intensive meditation and writing up that a lot of patients are having regression of coronary artery disease. Wow. I have to go and see it for myself and I will be doing that course, yeah. in December. So, I'm going to go and have a look. But, if, uh, but it makes sense from the point of view of that if you accept that heart disease is an inflammatory condition, we know that stress increases inflammation and we know that meditation, there is data showing it reduces it. Mm. So, therefore, that, that is plausible. Mm. It is certainly plausible. Um, but I need to see it for myself. Yeah. Very good. Asim, thanks yeah. very much. It's yeah. been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, yeah. thank you very you much. Too. Thank you. And we'll have to catch up with you after your trip to India. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I look forward to definitely yeah. looking at that. All right. Thank Take you. care. Could you save your due for a little? We had fun that day, didn't we? We did. We had a good dinner too. It was oh, all yeah. paleo food at the local restaurant, so that was really nice. Yeah. Yeah, we just happened to be at this hotel near his where there was mm. a Mediterranean restaurant in the hotel. Yeah. And that was sort of a no-brainer. Yeah, absolutely. I remember the, the burrata. Mm. Remember Wasn't that burrata? That the cheese, yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. delicious. I had it again the next day as well. Yeah. So, I'm actually starting mm. to feel a little bit hungry. Oh, you know sorry. what that means? <laughs> it's time for some <laughs> recipes. <laughs> oh yeah, recipes. Recipes. <laughs> so what do you got, Carl? Ah, well, I told you I was making a pumpkin pie. Yeah, you did. And what I really wanted to do was make a really good pie crust. Now mm -hmm. everybody knows the key ingredients in a pie crust are some sort of flour, yeah. butter, salt and some sort of liquid just to moisten it a little bit. Yeah. All right. So this was a no-brainer. Almond flour for the flour. However, mm -hmm. almond flour doesn't really stick together all that well. Yeah, it's got no gluten. It's got no gluten. It doesn't bind. Hmm. To two cups of fine almond flour, I added a tablespoon of konjac root powder. Right. So that'll help it bind. Yeah, it really does. It's like a, it's a starch that we can't digest. Hmm. And uh, there's no carbs or anything like that. And it's it really does a good job of binding things together. It's similar to xanthan gum, but it doesn't get slippery and slimy like xanthan gum. 
Nice. It just has a corn starchy quality to it. Mm. So then uh, I also add two teaspoons of kosher salt because you need a little of that. And mm-hmm. an entire stick or a half a cup of salted butter that's chilled. You always got to use chilled butter for pie crust. Yeah. Now, instead of water, which you typically use to moisten pie crust, I'm using two tablespoons, okay, maybe three, of Gosling's black rum. Yeah, or if you're Australian, you can use Bundaberg rum. Yeah, actually, you can use any alcohol. Some people use vodka. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that, and I've said this before on the show, it evaporates fast. Right. And that makes for a really crispy crust. Yeah, you did that with chicken nuggets one time, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. And it Mm. really works. It Mm -hmm. really does. All right. So here's what you do. I mean, if you've made pie crust before, you can pretty much just, you know how to do it. You just use these ingredients. But for those that haven't made a pie crust before, I use a uh, a pastry cutter. I don't right. know if you've seen these things before. Well, you saw it when you were at my house. Mm. It's sort of like yeah. a half moon with uh, a sort of a multi-blade thing on it and a handle, and you sort of rock it back and forth. Yeah, it's, it's like a potato masher, but it's made for blending pastry together, yeah. Right. Mm. So the first thing you do, preheat the oven to 350 Fahrenheit, that is. Mm-hmm. Chill a large stainless steel bowl in the freezer for about 10 minutes, and I got that yep. tip from Alton Brown. Actually, yep. I got that tip from my wife, Kelly, who got it who from got Alton it from Brown. Brown. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Uh, so you add all the dry ingredients to the bowl and you Mm -hmm. cut up the butter into small pieces and just plop it right into the dry ingredients and small pieces i'm thinking what a teaspoon per bite yeah 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 little cubes little cubes so do you use your fingers to blend them in together because that's the traditional way that's the thing that's the traditional way i didn't do Mm. that this way because i wanted like pockets of butter in the crust oh okay yeah so i use the uh pastry cutter to mash Mm -hmm. it all together for 30 seconds. And then after I did that, then I added the rum and continue to combine that until it gets to a pastry consistency. Yeah, you could probably use a large fork if you don't have one of those pastry You can, yeah. And you can use your hands too. It doesn't matter. You just blend it all together. Yeah. And like I say, don't worry about the butter not completely incorporating. That's actually a feature. (laughs) Not a bug. (laughs) It's not a bug. That's a feature. Uh, you don't have to do this, but I did. You wrap it in plastic wrap and chill it in the fridge for about 20 minutes. Um, I, yeah. I like to do that. just firms it up a little bit. Yeah. And then I just plop the whole thing into a standard pie plate and mush it out and spread it out to the edges with your hands. And I use the back of my index finger to press it down. <laughs> yeah. But you just got to make sure and you can spread it out to the edges and up the sides. Make sure that it's evenly distributed. You don't want any big clumps anywhere. Yeah. So then you crimp the edges with your fingers and thumb. You poke some holes in the bottom with a fork. That's called docking. Yep. And bake it for 10 to 12 minutes. I actually, mine went 15 minutes in my oven just because I wanted it to be a little more crispy. So do you use pie weights at all? No, I I didn't this time, but I have before. And Mm. what what Richard's talking about is these like marbles. You could almost think of them as marbles. A little ceramic. yeah. Or little ceramic beads and they and they hmm. weight down the, the pie crust yeah. so it doesn't poof up. Yeah. Yep. I didn't have that problem with this crust. Oh it well you don't have any you me. don't have any leavening agent in there. You don't have any baking powder or uh, or anything like that. So that's probably why. Well maybe, but also there's no leavening in standard pie crust and it does tend to poof up. So I'm oh, okay. not sure what cool. it is. I'm not sure what it is that makes that happen, but I didn't Steam, have that maybe. problem. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, so take it out and allow it to cool for about 15 minutes before adding any filling and, and rebaking. And again, this is just the bottom crust. Yeah. And next week, I'm going to tell you how to make a keto <laughs> pumpkin pie out of that crust. <laughs> nice. Well, I think I might actually do that pie crust here and uh, do a pecan pie. Oh, um, yeah. So I might do a pecan pie filling next week. So we might just do, we might go all pie next week. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be the but pie this, show. But this week I'm actually uh, borrowing a recipe from Brenda Zorn. And okay. this is her short ribs, one ingredient recipe. <laughs> Guess what the ingredient is? <laughs> uh, salt. <laughs> <laughs> no, short ribs. <laughs> no, you don't say. <laughs> so, uh, salt is optional, but I would use salt. Salt's always better with uh, 
with uh, beef. So what I like to do is I like to put it in a pressure cooker and cook it for an hour, and it yeah. comes out. It's slow cooked, but very quickly because it's in a right. pressure cooker. So yeah. it's kind of quickly slow cooked. But the way Brenda does it, she just uses a, a regular lodge cast iron pan with a Dutch oven top, which is like a second yeah. pan on top of it that that uh, that uh, you can basically put it into the oven. So what she does is she preheats her oven to two twenty five Fahrenheit. Mm-hmm. And she fries the short ribs on all sides. So what she's trying to do there is caramelize the outside. It seals the ribs so that some of the moisture stays in. And yeah. uh, it gets that sort of Maillard reaction starting to happen. Yeah. So she fries it on, on all sides. Um, she says, uh, stay attentive. This only takes a few minutes. Do not walk away. I know where you live. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't gonna walk away. Okay. I don't know no, that's no, you. heck no. <laughs> so anyway, what she does is she uh, she then uh, puts the lid on the Dutch oven and uh, puts it in the oven for five hours. Yes, five. This is key. Now remember, when I did it in a pressure cooker, you can do it in an hour. It's just yeah. as good. But well, um, two twenty five Fahrenheit's kind of low. So this yeah, is, it is really slow a low and slow. And slow. Barbecue, that's essentially what it is, yeah. Absolutely. So she says, when the five hours are up, close the curtains and lock the doors. (laughs) (laughs) Remove and reveal your culinary perfection to yourself. Hover over it greedily and growl menacingly. (laughs) And if you don't do that, she's going to kick your butt. (laughs) <laughs> she knows where we live. Uh, so anyway, she uh, she says, "Plate your masterpiece. Don't share. This is yours." And it, I mean, the, the bones just slide out, and the meat oh, is yeah. just unctuous. It's gelatinous and delicious. Um, she also does hers with mushrooms, and this is all on the ketogenic forum, obviously. So yeah. uh, we'll have links to that in the show notes. Excellent. That's worth doing. Mm-hmm. Awesome. What a great yeah. show. Yeah. And uh, I really enjoyed hanging out in New York with uh, with you and Asim. It was, was a great dinner, and we learned a lot. We did. Yeah. So, of course, if you have anything that you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something you don't agree with, some more research that you found to support or refute anything that we've said, send it by email to dudes at twoketodudes.com or post it on our website. And you can follow us on Twitter at Two Keto Dudes, on yep. Instagram at Two Keto Dudes, and make sure to use the hashtag Two Keto Dudes. And of course, if you want to join the free ketogenic forum, it's forum.2keto.com. And if useless swag is your fancy, like t-shirts, coffee mugs, and all that other junk, head over to gear.2keto.com. And if you want a shot at getting some of that swag for free, join the 2 Keto Dudes fan club. You'll be eligible to win something in every show. Go to fanclub.2keto.com. And if you feel like supporting our podcasts and our forums... Think about making a pledge on our Patreon page at patreon.2keto.com. Or just hit the donate button on our website at www.2ketodudes.com or go to donate.2keto.com. And you can also see all of our podcasts and other videos on YouTube at youtube.2keto.com. And if you haven't already, go leave us a review on iTunes. That's how new people get to know what we do. Two Keto Dudes is brought to you by Two Keto LLC, who strives to support the low-carb community with podcasts and other publications. Well, keep calm and keto on, Richard. Yeah, keep calm and keto on, Carl. All right, and we'll see you next time on Two Keto Dudes. Dudes.